the Atlantic Ocean. It's the second biggest body of water on the planet. Covering 20% of the Earth's surface, it measures approximately 41 million square miles and hits a depth of over 27,000 feet. Ever since mankind was able to put a boat on the water, we've been obsessed with crossing it. And there's no better example of that obsession than the Talisca Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. A 3,000 mile rowing race from La Gomera in the Canary Islands to Antigua in the Caribbean. It's been dubbed the toughest endurance race on the planet. Rowing two hours on and two hours off, 24 hours a day for over 40 days, the rowers face 40 foot waves physical and mental exhaustion. Seriously tough challenge we're taking on. Sleep deprivation, isolation, storms, and for the unlucky ones, capsize. This is the story of the 2015 race. Oh, La Gomera, one of the smallest of the Canary Islands that lies off the west coast of Africa. This is the very spot where Christopher Columbus set sail for the New World over 500 years ago. For the 26 crews of the 2015 Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge, this is the final departure point on a journey that has already taken many years of training, preparation and sacrifice. Our whole goal for the last 18 months has been getting to this point and now we're having to switch our focus to the next goal, which is getting 3,000 miles across this ocean. We've just got to get our hours on the water. There's a few checks we've got to do. We've been planning this for two and a half, three years, so I'm just ready to start. The Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge attracts competitors from all over the world, from Uber athletes to ordinary Joes. They compete in teams of four, two, or as solos. This year, there's a team of mums from Yorkshire, an endurance athlete from South Africa, an Antiguan team hoping to be the oldest crew to cross an ocean, and a team of injured military personnel who'll become the first all-amputee crew to cross an ocean if they make it to Antigua. With just a few days before race start, they check and double-check all their kit, overseen by Atlantic Campaign's senior duty officer, Ian Couch, who's rowed this ocean twice before. By the time the crews get to Gamera, it's been two years in the preparation and planning, and they are desperate to get going. It's a huge and very dangerous undertaking they've got ahead of them, though. Storms can develop really, really quickly. Rogue waves can come out of nowhere and capsize a boat. If an individual's not tied on thoroughly to his boat and he gets taken overside, he's gone and he's lost, and we won't be able to recover them. Although there'll be two support boats tracking the fleet, the crews are essentially unsupported. Part of my job while we're there in Gomera is to make sure the teams are 100% prepared and self-sufficient, that all their equipment works and that they are safe to cross. As race start gets closer and there's nothing left to check, thoughts inevitably turn to the immensity of the challenge ahead. It's six days until the race start and it's beginning to feel really, really real. We are about to row an ocean and uh... It's going to be hard, it's going to be painful, it's going to be dangerous, and I think we're starting to feel it. It's going to be tough. We're ready to have the darkest hour. We haven't really witnessed any of the big seas or anything out there yet. I think once we get out and see the big waves and things and the nerves might kick in. It's pretty daunting, because if you thought about it in all of its entirety, it would uh, probably get you a little, little freaked out. One person who knows all about the nerves is Lauren Morton. I was here two years ago, and it's just, it almost feels like two years didn't happen. It's so surreal. It's really familiar, but not in a good way. <laughs> in 2013, Lauren entered the race, battling to within just 270 miles of Antigua before the rudder fell off her boat, leaving her marooned. Everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. It was a catalogue of errors. Our auto helm snapped off. We had a battery fire. Our rudder snapped off. We capsized. I have split my head open. I never got to be able to say I actually rode across the Atlantic Ocean. I can say I kind of did it, but I never got that eye at the finish line. And uh, for me, that's the biggest motivator. Two years ago, I did it as a pair, but this time around, we're coming back 
as a four. Nothing is going to stop me. I'll swim with that boat, dragging it in my teeth with the rope. Ocean rowing is still a relatively young sport, but it's advancing very, very quickly. There are huge changes in boat design and people's attitude. More and more people are now coming in to win and win in the fastest possible time. So I'm Angus from Skipper of Ocean Reunion. I built the boat that I'm rowing in, the R25. It's a four-man boat and the fastest four-man boat out there. All four of us went to school together. Jack is highly, highly competitive, very driven, and probably the bossy one. You feel like you can't prepare enough. We've been doing it two years, and obviously we started without a boat, literally nothing. Um, so it's a pretty good feeling just to have got to the start line, but we've got to make sure everything goes right. Gus is he's a personal trainer, and he's a really caring guy, always looking out for other people. Joe is extremely stubborn, will not give up. We've been talking about doing this for years and years, but it's kind of showtime now. We've actually, we've got to do it. We've had to sacrifice a lot. Thomas have lost jobs, lost girlfriends, had to sacrifice a lot of our social life. We've done as much as we can. We've done a 1,000 miles of training. Current world record for a four-man cruise, 34 days and 13 hours. So we're aiming to come in under that. Angus and his team are one of the favorites for the race, but they've got competition. Flying the flag for the United States, Latitude 35 are a team of semi-professional rowers who believe they can redefine ocean rowing. So our goal is, and how it's always been, to row these 3,000 miles in 30 days. There's two ends of this spectrum for this race. You've got, on one end, the salty sailors. They can take storms, they know how to read storms, they can overcorrect, they can take harsh conditions, and that is certainly a lot to be said there. And then on the other end of the spectrum is pretty much our team. We've created a new spectrum, I think, which is this elite athlete that comes from the traditional rowing background, Tom Magaroff. Tom and I have worked together for the last three years. Since then, him and I have become very, very close. Greg Wood, when we started, he wasn't on the team. And um, he had always talked about being part of this team, should he need, we need an extra guy. So we tapped him on the shoulder. He's an excellent rower, and we, we, we really got that we got lucky with him. Well, I don't think for 30 days anybody wants to be stuck in the boat with their four mates, but uh, you guys, you have to bond. You're not leaving. You can't just say, I quit, and one of you gets out and walk away. Nick Kahn is number four, six foot four, great rower. His physical prowess is, is off the charts. So I have about 15 years of river rowing experience. A uh, little, di little different to ocean rowing, for sure. Um, but thankfully enough, a lot of similarities. So we all, we all feel pretty comfortable out here. It's, it's, it's definitely different than rowing on a river. But we've spent the last week out here, and we've already, because of our athleticism, we've caught on a lot quicker. It doesn't matter that they haven't been on the ocean. It matters that they understand what pain is all about, and they don't know how to fight through that. I could be wrong. <laughs> Talk to me after this race, and if we finish in 50 days, then Everyone can say I told you so. But with less than 24 hours to go, the shootout between Ocean Reunion and Latitude 35 could be over before it begins. Unfortunately, our water makers kind of stopped working, um, and this is now the day before we leave, so a little bit nerve wracking. Water makers are basically an electric pump that sucks up seawater and forces it under huge pressure through a membrane leaving fresh water and salt separate. Every crew has to have at least one electronic water maker on board and a manual hand pump as backup. Such an essential piece of equipment because without water, the human can expect to live only about three days. The simple fact is, is it's, it's a safety issue. Uh, water makers are showstoppers. Uh, so if they can't get this fixed, then they can't start the race. It's as simple as that. What about this the bit that I just turned 90 degrees one way? If I turn that right down, would that not? No. You worked to date for two years, and um, we have 24 hours to go. It's not looking like we're going to go at the moment. The newest idea is to take a new membrane out of this boat here. Back in the back. Take that membrane and try and fit it into our water maker. Good. So we've got a water maker 
Um, same model as ours. Same model as ours, for the looks of it. Angus and his team have less than 14 hours to swap, connect and test the new membrane, a job that would normally take three days. It's now four o'clock, gets dark in two hours, and race starts tomorrow morning. So we're pretty much right up against the clock. It's the morning of the race, and at the dawn briefing, crews are waiting to see if Ocean Reunion will show up. Did five or six test runs, went out, kept going out of the marina, started running fine. So then we had to fix it all down, so do all the plumbing throughout the boat, which normally takes about three days. Uh, took four of us who did it last night, finished at two o'clock in the morning, and so far it's working. So we're on. Okay, guys, this is it. The Talska Whiskey Atlantic Challenge 2015 is about to get started. Just wish you the very, very best of luck and for a fast, safe crossing. For the 26 crews of the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge, this is the point of no return. The next time they see land will be Antigua, 3,000 miles away. Leading off the fleet are the mums from Yorkshire. We're way more prepared than we were, and we're really strong. So I actually have nothing to worry about. It's just the, like, it's the like emotion of it all. It's like all this planning that you've been doing for like two years or however long. It's like, um, I'm just not very good with goodbyes. <laughs> We will get there. Put my heart and soul into this. I'm sad to uh, to go and leave my uh, my parents and my girlfriend, but uh, put so much work into this. I think the only way now it's uh, it's towards Antigua. For a lot of people, when they go out the first 24 hours, they probably will never remember it. It's such a huge culture shock. Well, there's a bit of a wake-up call. Just had my, my, my first, um, and hopefully also the, uh, the the last capsize. Had a rough old night last night, a lot of chundering. Helen's been a little bit sick, so we're trying to get into her lots of food and water. You don't stop rowing, and that, that is the mad thing about it is continuous. Just trying to find uh, my routine. Things are, are getting better. Starting to develop the first uh, few blisters on, on my hand, on my feet. Even though they've done rows offshore before and they've trained, the big mental switch is actually this time we're not turning around and going back in in a few hours. The next time we see land is going to be in Antigua. That's a huge realization for a lot of people. And no one feels this more than the solo rowers. I also just had, uh, had the first phone call home. I must admit, I, I just uh, just lost it. Um, yeah, I shed a few tears then. South African Greg Maud is a committed adventurer and ultra athlete, but still very much a family man. So here, where there are lots of little lines, little dashes, that's a weak account. I've got involved in this challenge because I've, I've always loved, uh, loved adventure. I've, I've done a, a lot of running. Uh, it's a little bit over 150 marathons, um, a number of Ironman triathlons. I've climbed Mount Everest. I've done a, a sort of 1,000K run across the Kalahari Desert. But, uh, but rowing is something that's entirely new to me. And uh, rowing the Atlantic has to be one of the, the big classic adventures out there. I think my biggest fear is really that I don't have what it takes to get across and that despite the training, the preparation, that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm unsuccessful. Also competing in the solo category is Matteo Perrucchini, an Italian from Renault, 
a small village on the edge of Lake Maggiore, where rowing is a religion. You know, when I first learned about ocean rowing, it wasn't, why would people do this? It was like, how am I going to achieve this? The Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge is a dream that I've had for a very long time. Working with my family on this challenge is, is incredible. I've been away from home for many, many years, and now this challenge is giving me the opportunity to, uh, to reconnect with, uh, with a business which has been in the family for many generations. For me, it's a journey, an experience, but it is a race, and if I am in a position to, to race and, and win, I'll, I'll definitely go for it. Despite their last-minute drama with the watermaker, by day five, Favourite's Ocean Reunion are 390 miles from La Gomera, in the lead and pushing hard. Two hours on, two hours off, and this is a wake-up. We have literally broken our bodies for the last three days. We're all pretty knackered. The two hours on, two hours off shift pattern since when we left has been pretty relentless, to be honest came out with a game plan that we're going to have three zones across the Atlantic. So zone one is 900 miles, zone three is 900 miles, and you've got the middle stage. Generally speaking, the teams that are winning at the end of zone one win the race. For the women of Row Like a Girl, rather than heading straight west, the shortest route, Lauren the skipper has a tactical plan to make the most of better conditions further south. And we looked on the laptop and we saw that there was going to be like a low pressure system that pushed us north. And so we knew that if we could get so far south from that low pressure system that we would potentially miss the bad weather. And it would be slow, but we would be able to make progress west. Even though we thought we were doing the right thing, everybody would just basically thought we were a bit of a laughing stock. They were emailing the boat, telling us that we'd gone too far south, that it was a no-brainer, we should head west. Thought there were just four girls going the wrong way. One of the pre-race favourites, US crew Latitude 35, had aimed to smash the world record and cross the Atlantic in just 30 days. But by day eight, they're in trouble. The waves that we were seeing a couple miles outside of La Gomera was nothing that we were going to see out there. Those little five, 10 foot waves turned into 30 or 40 foot swells. And it didn't take more than a half a day for Nick to start taking a turn for the worst. He would stop, he would throw up, he would keep rowing for an hour or two, go back to the cabin over a day or two, which is longer than I would have been able to do it. He was no longer able to come out uh, out of the cabin. And then finally, it got to a point where he couldn't even move. It's day 13 of the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. New Year's Day, and the crew of Ocean Reunion are in good spirits. This is... <laughs> Big day for all of us. We got a fishy on the line. They're leading the race. Cruising along at 3.4 knots, and it's all going according to plan. We got a little bit of. His Rick Stein's been going at it. Got a bit of lemon. We got some soy. We got a little bit of salt. And this is finished product. I mean, he plated it up nice. Go on then, Jackie. Go, go, go for a mouthful. Genuinely divine. Pure protein, Gone. that. 340 miles further back, there's nothing to celebrate for rivals Latitude 35. Their strongest rower, Nick Khan, has chronic seasickness. Unable to keep down any food or fluids, the decision is taken to get him off the boat. It's a huge blow for skipper Jason, and when the support boat arrives, it gets worse. We knew Nick was gone, but I was very surprised by the fact that Greg came up to me and said, um, I'm thinking about getting on the evacuation boat as well. And he, he was getting very nervous. And he said, I'm going to be honest with you, quite frankly, everything in my body right now is telling me to leave. When you hear somebody say that, it's really tough to tell someone, well, you need to suck it up and, and stay. Um, it's hard to tell another person who's feeling that, that kind of a pull to stay if you feel your life's in danger. And as a skipper, you have a responsibility to make sure that people don't feel like that. The rescue team now have to pull off a major feat in high seas, extracting not just one, but two people, one of whom is critically ill. Greg got off fairly easily because he was stronger and, you know, he could do it. OK, grab all the fully, fully back. Can you take the 
se perdi, ramo de ramo. Right. Come on in. Um, so he got on, and this is where it got difficult. Nick was so weak he could barely lift himself up. We dressed him, we put his dry bag with all his personals on him, and we propped him up against the boat as if like he was a doll. And at this point, by the way, he is petrified. Hey! The first thing that happens is that he loses the line. He then proceeds to go underneath our boat. He's gone. A few seconds later, he pops off the other side of the boat, screaming. He's, he's completely out of his mind, scared. Oh! You're, you're fine, you're fine. Hang on, hang on. We got you! When we decided that evacuation is going to happen, uh, I thought the race was over. I said, how do you feel about sticking this out? It would just be me and you. And he said, Jay, we can't do this by ourselves. He said, yeah, we can do this by ourselves. And I said, think about the glory that you could do two men rowing a boat that's supposed to be rowed by four across the Atlantic Ocean, 2,400 more miles to go. He's, he's one of my best friends. He's like a big brother to me. And I, and, I, and I said, I will, I will stay here with you. And you know, that's when we gave me, you know, gave me a kiss on the forehead, and I was like, all right, this is it. It was the grandest gesture that anyone has made for me. So Latitude 35, who had dreams of setting a new world record, are now focused on simply reaching Antigua. From a boat of four, they're now a pair. But at least they still have each other. Solo rowers Matteo Perrocchini and Greg Maud have no one to share the pain with. The magnitude of the, the challenge that lies ahead is still uh, it's becoming clear, and uh, yeah, I'm going to have to start uh, sticking deep and um, yeah, just sticking, sticking with it. I don't know what the heck is wrong with me. For years, I've been wanting to, uh, to take part in this race. And now I just wish I was um, I was home with my family and my girlfriend. All right, Lauren, what do you have for breakfast today? So I've conjured up a little uh, Morton Especial for this morning's breakfast. Um, normally we have freeze-dried scrambled egg, ham and potato, but it's a little bit on the dry side and a little bit salty. However, if you add wet packaged sausage and baked beans from our wet rations into it to make the almighty English breakfast, it's like a dream come true. Look at that. Ocean rowing isn't just about brawn. It's about strategy and planning. And Row Like a Girl had done brilliantly with their strategy, heading almost due south at the beginning to pick up the trade winds that now helped them push west and clock up more miles per day than Ocean Reunion. I don't think we ever thought that we were going to be in a position to actually genuinely race this. And, and now that we are, um, it's been a bit of a turn in our mentality. I think it's race on. It crossed our mind that actually maybe we could fight for first position. All of our competitive spirits came out. We were gunning it. We knew Ocean Reunion in front of us. And every day we were like, how many miles have they done? How, how far are they in front of us? There was a couple of days in the race where they had done more miles than us, and we knew, we knew that. You'd wake up and you'd slogged your guts out for 24 hours. And uh, that is that was demoralising. For Skipper Angus, there's even more at stake than just race positions. Bella, who's on row like a girl, is his sister. I've got two older brothers. One of them gives me a lot of grief. He wrote a letter to me, actually, before I left, and just said, Angus, don't bother coming home if you just beat you. I can see the rain falling, and it's going to be intense. 
Hurricane Alex was the first hurricane to form in the mid-Atlantic in January since 1938. The shock waves from the storm hit the fleet on day 22, the 11th of January. We've been for the last 24 hours fighting in really bad conditions. Uh, and then it got to the point where we were literally just going, going pretty much dead north. So uh, a bit mixed feelings. We had to put the power anchor out. The boys on watch are getting a bit of a seeing too. It is absolutely impossible to row into a storm. So the crews deploy a power anchor, which is basically a large parachute that inflates in the water and holds them head on into the oncoming waves and storm and stops too much backward drift. I didn't want to put that power anchor out in any circumstances. Out it goes. I knew that damage to the boat would get done. I knew that it's hard for morale and psychologically to start again, but we didn't have a choice. In the cabin, while you're on power anchor, it's like being inside a washing machine. It's loud, the waves smash on the side of the cabin. It is hot, damp, and just very, very unpleasant. Uh, second day on the power anchor. You must have rather be somewhere else. You can't have the cabin door open. You can't have anything open. That hatch is completely sealed because there's water everywhere coming all over the boat. I mean, it's cramped anyway on that boat, if you think about it. You've got minimal personal space. And then there's two of you, red hot, lying next to each other in this sweat box. Horrible. I got hit by quite big swells from the east. Back my head quite a few times, elbows, hip. So I'm actually quite sore this morning. After 18 hours on para anchor, the boys from Ocean Reunion are losing their grip on the world record. Despite adverse winds and currents pushing them north, they decide to fight the conditions, rowing as hard as they can to get back on track. I got up this morning and got going. There's a three up, two point three hours. We have two hours, 40 minutes rest, and then back on the oars again. We'll see how long we can sustain that for. Uh, absolutely shagged ourselves, ate, ate a small meal, didn't even have time to sleep, and then get back on the oars. We had all pretty low, not much sleep. Makes the whole thing pretty difficult. Battle on to tonight and see how far we can get. While Ocean Reunion summon the strength to fight for the world record, Greg Maud and Matteo Perrucchini are still on para anchor. Less than 10 nautical miles apart, They've spent 72 hours alone in their tiny cabins, and it's taken its toll. Day 24 it continues to be a tough day. It's pretty rough outside. Had a couple of uh, close calls, almost uh, almost a capsize. Um, been quite a roller coaster, and um, yeah, I think uh, next to everything else, I think I need to get a bit more sleep tonight. <laughs> Today is the first day that I really felt like uh, uh, like quitting. Um, and the hard thing is that I know there's no way. There's no way. For anybody thinking of rowing an ocean, it's flipping hard. Two crews came into this race hoping to break the world record for the fastest crossing by a four. Latitude 35 lost two crew members and are now just trying to survive to Antigua as a pair. Ocean Reunion, now just 840 miles from Antigua, realized that their record attempt is in vain, beaten by the sea conditions and the weather. We only covered 15 miles that day, where we needed to cover at least 60. And suddenly that lead that we had on the record just disappeared which I suppose, it, yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's just the most gut-wrenching feeling of having something you thought was attainable and what you believed you could do just away from you. If you sat and rode for, did those 10 hours, and it just, it, I suppose it's those, like those things that happen, why it happened, I don't know, but that was when the sun came out and this whale started swimming around the boat. Talk yeah, sir, 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 sir. Oh, yeah, oh, my God. Up you come, old boy. You need something like that to kind of drag your mind away from what's just happened and to focus on something completely differently. That change meant there was something else for us to talk about on the boat other than the fact that a record's just been blown away from us. Yeah, it's wicked, mate. Yeah.
The storm has finally passed, and all crews are off para anchor and back on track, except row like a girl in second place, who have a problem. Very quickly it became apparent that we were just not turning, and the hand steering was just not pulling right. And Lauren said, you know, this isn't right, this isn't right. If anything's going to go wrong with the boat, I didn't want it to be the rudder. The only thing that stopped me last time was the rudder snapping off. First thing I thought before I thought, oh, this could be game over, was, oh my goodness, what is Lauren going to think? It's day 25, and as most crews steam towards Antigua, second place row like a girl discover a potentially fatal problem with their rudder. Bella took the hatch off and she was like, well, it's all lined up properly, it looks fine, it looks fine. But I said, no, no, something's not right, look at it. Look at the actual mechanism. Don't just look at the part that's swinging, look at the mechanism of the rudder. And she just said, it's the pin meant to be like loose and wobbling. And they were like, no, Bella. I was like, uh. And I was just like, oh my God, panic threw my oars in, dived into the cabin. And I was just, just waiting there silently. Um, and no one was saying anything, so I knew that, that something was wrong. Look, it's completely shredded. Is that the inside of the rudder? Yeah, that's the rudder, I think. And eventually, Bella kind of popped her head out of the cabin. She said, do you want to come in? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I want to come in. What is a fillet or something? We decided to epoxy the inside which is sort of this marine clay sealant, which is used to fill holes in boats. You can imagine how strong it is. We managed to guide an Allen key through one side, and then Libs and Ambella are going to get in the water and hold the rudder straight. And then I'm going to try and drill through the old rudder to make a second hole. Libs, are you OK? Yeah. Holding the rudder, Libs. Lauren, it's in place. Oh, hurry. Careful, Lib. Lauren got the drill and just managed to find the hole and drill through. Oh, she's got it through, she's got it through half. Come back, come back. Then so we had the problem of, OK, cool, so we've got it in place, but um, what are we going to pin it with? Liv was on deck to saw and off the screwdrivers to try and make it fit into this little gap. Uh, Lauren ripped the drill out and tried to shove the screwdriver through. It's going to do it. Pins out, pins out. Quick. It's in, it's in, it's in, it's in. It's in. Yay! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> you run a pin. That was what was so interesting about our team, is the way we handled that. Because it could have been the worst time. It could have been the time that we ripped each other to shreds. And, you know, people were surviving off 20 minutes sleep of a shift. Yet we still supported each other through it all. So I think had we not have done that, it would have been a very different trip. Up ahead and former schoolmates' ocean reunion are closing in on the finish line. The world record has gone, but they're still on course to beat the race record for the fastest crossing by a four. And yet the Atlantic will not give this up so easily. That last week just dragged on and dragged on. We got slower and slower, and we started hitting back eddies and currents closer to Antigua. And we thought we'd come in on Sunday night, and then we're going to come in Monday morning, and then it's going to be Monday afternoon, and then Tuesday morning. Less than 200 miles to go. Someone does not want us to bloody finish. Ah, uh, now rowing three up. They're pulling a ton's worth of weight through the water. No wind helping us, no waves, no currents. It's just flat calm, so every stroke is an absolute backbreaker. That was really, really tough, and I had to quite a few times just go and take myself into the cabin at the end of a shift and just sit down and think, right, stop playing numbers, stop trying to put down when you think you're going to finish, and stop thinking about your girlfriend and your family back home. Just think about the fact that you've got to wake up until this time and go rowing. The battle between solo rowers Matteo and Greg is really hotting up. Matteo's more southerly route is starting to pay dividends. After over 1,500 miles of racing, he's just seven miles behind, and he has the better current. Even if I gain a mile a day, I may still, may still catch him. And that's when I made the decision to, to go for it. I said, you know, take a week and just, you know, up your game for a week. So I thought, you know, go for it. In a week's time, let's see where we are. Day 26. It's just incredibly hot today. Plenty of rowing ahead. Day 27. And all I can do is uh, roll some more. Day 30. Day 32. I rode most of the night. Day um, 
Uh, I pushed really, really hard to secure the lead in the solo category over the last 10 days. 18, 20, 22 hours a day on the oars, racing, racing, racing. After a week's intense rowing, Matteo has put 50 miles into Greg Maud and is now ahead in the solos category for the first time. Back at the head of the fleet, Ocean Reunion, the crew who almost never started because of a faulty water maker, have battled through the final miles to victory and a new race record. So we're about seven miles from Antigua. We had seen kind of Antigua get closer and closer on the map. We then saw its silhouette. We were kind of like, this is a bit of an, is this a bit of an anticlimax? As we came round the corner, Maybe all the super yachts started honking their horns. Yeah, As we kind of came across the official finish line and let our flares off and everything, that was a pretty good feeling. But then to come in and kind of get on the dock and everyone was going nuts, it was, like, it was almost like we got a gold medal at the Olympics or something. Not in a million years thought that we were going to get that reception. Ladies and gentlemen, 37 days, 9 hours and 12 minutes, new race record. I don't think there'll be a kind of happier moment. Like, how do you top that as a happier moment in your life? Like, it's it, just the euphoria of it. It's just incredible. You dream about like, this moment coming in, like having family and friends and everyone here. And then can you imagine it to be like this? You realise, wow, what we've just achieved is pretty massive. And obviously, on top of that, coming in with the race record. Best feeling in the world. <laughs> it's day 39, and the battle of the solos is still in the balance. With a lead of just 40 miles over Greg Maud, Matteo Perrocchini is heading the solo competition, but cannot afford to slip up. Yesterday, while I was making some food, I um, knocked the jet ball over to my foot. So now I've got uh, a humongous um, blister on my foot. Yesterday was a real struggle to, uh, to row and put pressure on it. After a near miss with their rudder, Row Like a Girl are closing in on Antigua and still holding second place. For Lauren, it's the end of a journey that has consumed her for over four years. So, we've just passed under the 150-mile marker to go. I don't know if I'm kind of desperate for it to be over. I don't know if I don't want it to be over at all because then that, this has been such a huge part of my life for, like, two and a half years that, that it's coming to an end and then I've kind of got to get on with it, kind of got to get on with life and stop talking about rowing across the Atlantic. And then I swung from, from counting down the miles, like desperation in wanting to be the finish, to all of a sudden thinking, I don't want, I actually don't want to get off this boat. I don't want this amazing adventure to end. Oh my God. We can basically just see Antigua. It looks so close. It's, <laughs> I just can't believe it. I don't think anything could have prepared us for the actual finish. You've done it, mate. It's over. And I kept glancing around, and I just could see more and more colours and more and more boats and people. And, and then I saw the finish boys. And that is the finish line. And we went through them, and then a million horns went off. It was crazy. I was saying to them that I probably wouldn't cry and it's not really my thing and whatever. One of the foghorns went off on one of the super yachts and I broke down. <laughs> I think I was probably the worst one out of all of us. <laughs> it was just so overwhelming. That was the whole feeling. It was so overwhelming. Oh, God, yeah, I'm so emotional. Oh, my. Um... <laughs> I'm so awful about it. With a time of 40 days and eight hours, the girls have come second in the race and also got the world record for the fastest female four to row the Atlantic. That was hands down the best moment of my life. I don't think having children, I don't think getting married could ever be that. An indescribable, overwhelming just sense of absolute elation. It was incredible. 
I thought it was going to be my mom and my dad that made me cry. Um, but seeing Angus cry was the hardest bit for me because um, I've never seen him cry. I don't know. It was so cool. <laughs> Good, how are you? Well done. Well done. Well done. I don't think ocean rowing is about physical toughness. I don't think it is actually about training. I don't think it's about how many miles you've done. It's about who you're doing it with and those relationships, because they determine your mood. They determine how willing you are to try. After 51 days at sea, the remaining crew of Latitude 35, Jason Caldwell and Tom Magarov, who've rowed a four-man boat for over 2,400 miles, close in on Antigua. Battered but not broken, the crossing has taught them a hard lesson. I think we made a lot of mistakes out there, and one of them was being audacious enough to think that we could have such a strict plan that we were going to go off of and that the, the, the ocean, that the Atlantic and the elements were gonna allow us to just go with our plan. And that, that, that's so naive. You don't get to pick your cards. He's a rock, he is the Superman. He, he handled everything like a rock star and I was proud to be on that boat with him. I was proud to share those moments with him. It was just amazing being out there doing something like this. Less than 24 hours behind Latitude 35, Italian Matteo has held on and is on the verge of victory in the solos class. It seems impossible that, uh, that I'm here, that uh, I'm only 47 miles from Antigua, that tomorrow I'll get to see my, uh, my family and, uh, and my girl. to row across the Atlantic Ocean with 52 days, 3 hours, and 26 minutes. You know, if I have to think about it, I would say that out of this, I would take the crossing for myself. You know, actually having achieved the crossing, that's, that's mine. Um, the winning and everything like that, I guess that's for all the people that have supported me. Just 24 hours after Matteo claims first place in the solos category, Greg rows into the harbor. He's the 16th boat home. 26 boats left La Gomera, and 26 have arrived safely in Antigua. Last boat home after 80 days is Steve Murphy. For Lauren Morton, it's time at last to put the disappointments of 2013 behind her. I think that I was massively unprepared for the first attempt, but I feel I'm able to accept that more now. You know, yes, they went wrong, and yes, I did things that were wrong, but it's okay, because it doesn't matter anymore, because I still, I went back and I did it, and I went back and I smashed it. Yeah.